from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 131, recorded on April 13th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Yellow, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is um, it's a nice day out there. It's not so bad. I mean, the temperature is good. Temperature it's got a little, a little cooler. It was, little, you know, hazy. You know, it was too warm for this time of the year. Let's check out the weather here. It is partly cloudy, 17 Celsius. Right. Which is about right for this. What is it? We're halfway through yeah. April. A little, with a little bit of wind. Happy to tell both of you that we have a guest today. This is exciting. Very exciting. Yep. Comes from all the way over in Lincoln, Nebraska, University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He's Jonathan Larson. Welcome to TWIP, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, you want to be called Jonathan or John? Uh, I go by Jonathan in the office because there are two. the only other two <laughs> men in the office are John's. So I go All by right. Jonathan. We have Jonathan. a lot of Johns in New York, but that's another story. <laughs> no, no, we have a shortage, right? We talked about that last time, a shortage. Ah, well. Jonathan, you are a Nebraska Extension Entomology Educator. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And you're also the host of Arthropod. Yeah, that's my bug show that I, I try to host once a month. Yeah, we're happy to hear. I, I um. Tried to start a uh, insect podcast a couple of months ago, and someone said, "You know, there's one out there called Arthropod. Why don't you check it out?" And I said, "Great!" <laughs> and that's why I, that's how I found you, and that's uh, how I got involved with your book and everything. So thanks lovely. to that person, yeah, that your book, listening. your book, it's gentlemen, both, the it's both of our parasites. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember saying that uh, he had a podcast to you last time, when and that was what made me listen. And then when I listened, I reached out to Jonathan and. Uh, it's all it's all history. We are grateful for your contributions, by the way. It was a, it was a lot of fun to go through. I told Daniel when he emailed me, it was the most interesting email I've received in quite some time. <laughs> I've never been asked to do something like this before. Uh, so well, I was tickled. Uh, That's we, great. Will, we will give you credit in our acknowledgement. Jonathan, where are you? We, we did actually. He uh, he already has a copy of the newest version. Outstanding. And, uh, Changes yes. on an hourly basis. Right? <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> Jonathan, where are you from originally? I'm from Indiana originally, really? so another Indiana. corn state. What yeah. part? Uh, I'm from Tipton, Indiana. It's about an it hour north of Indianapolis. I know where it is. Hmm. My first, really? My first child was born in South Bend. Oh, okay. That's where I got my PhD. Oh, Notre Dame, huh? Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> I, know, okay, I, I know, I know, I know, I <laughs> know. <laughs> Listen, they were very good in entomology there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have a great mosquito biologist. That's, that's, his name is George B. Craig, and I actually did work with him. Oh, cool. Hmm. Small world. You, did you uh, grow up there, Jonathan? I did. I grew up in the middle of nowhere and went to Purdue for my undergrad. Purdue, wow. Kentucky, hmm. my PhD. <laughs> oh, that's those are two great schools. What, what um, did you major in at Purdue? Entomology. I was in the undergrad program there at their entomology department. So, nice. were you? Had you always been interested in uh, insects and et cetera? <laughs> Uh, I always had a little bit of a fascination with them, and I did a 4-H project in middle school, yeah. and I won my mm -hmm. county because I was the only entrant, and <laughs> that means you automatically get to go to the state you fair. You know what? That's a great and, deal. I show you. And when you go to the state fair, you get invited to the department, and I met all the professors there, and I was oh, like, nice. you're all delightfully weird. I want to be That's like right. you. That's so right. they are. <laughs> here we are. I so I, when I was talking about a, a podcast, I called it a bug podcast, and someone said that's not right because there are only if some true bugs. So, Jonathan, if I wanted to say, how can I include everything? Would I have to say insects, 
and arachnids arthropods arthropods well, you would be yeah th- that's my show's name arthropod <laughs> so arthropod will cover everything. however no well you know there are arthropods that are not insects or arachnids that's true we've got the crustaceans yeah exactly. we've got exactly we've got the millipedes the centipedes that's right Do you talk about those on arthropod we're doing a cool little thing right now where we're going to go through all of arthropoda we're going to try and cover yeah, all the neat. different holy class- cow yeah you know i uh You'll be amused that on my uh, preliminary examination at Notre Dame, uh, George Craig was on my committee, and his one of his questions was to name all the orders of insects. <laughs> <laughs> Guess which one I left out. I got them all except one. Uh, if if the story is going to be as amusing as I think, it was Diptera? <laughs> no, Coleoptera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Coleoptera. That, that's a tough one. Even worse. <laughs> I got some weirdos, you know, but I I I, I completely blanked out on arthropods. So that would be too encompassing, right? It would be too encompassing. But if you, if you said insects and, and arachnids, arachnids, that would work. Perfect. Or or hexapod. Hexapod. That's hexapod. Oh, the that's a good name. Are part of hexapod. That's a Hex- good name for a podcast. Hexapod. I like that. Hex- yeah, but then you left out the arachnids. <laughs> and- no, that's right. Well, how can and people we- might think you're like a Wiccan podcast or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Jonathan, when you did a postdoc, what was it on? I actually didn't do a postdoc. I'm sorry, I, uh, PhD. I, your PhD, yeah. what was it on? Uh, I was uh, focused on lawn insecticides and pollinators, trying to make sure that we weren't killing all of the bumblebees and honeybees. Mm. And how did that work out for you? <laughs> it worked out well. We found some really fascinating stuff, some ways that lawn care applicators can make sure they don't harm pollinators uh-huh. and some insecticides that don't harm the good bugs. So it was a lot of fun. But aren't we still using some of those that we shouldn't be? We have the neonicotinoids still on the market, yeah. but if you spray them correctly, they don't have the impact on pollinators that they can when you just spray them all over God's creation. So what do you think is the cause of colony collapse syndrome? Ah. Uh, <laughs> is this a what? rapid fire okay. thing here? Long, no, I just wanted to know how deep we should probe. <laughs> Uh, is a job there's, interview? <laughs> there's a lot of different things involved. There's the diseases, there's yeah. the mites, yeah. there's the insecticides, yeah. and urbanization. And some viruses, too. And yes, absolutely. Viruses. Israeli acute paralysis virus is, is a big deal with colony collapse. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, so it's a lot of things. All right. right? As is usual. Uh, I had As, one I had one more question. What was okay. it? You made me forget it, Dixon. I'm sorry. I'm just excited to have a medical ent- a, a regular entomologist on there. <laughs> you know, this guy knows a lot about everything, not just medical. So this is good. It was a, it was a good question too. It's gone. That's so, it's that's gone. okay. Maybe it'll come later. <laughs> Hexapods. Well, let's talk about um, our case and maybe. Uh, ah. Yeah, maybe it's back. a maybe it's now a hint to our listeners that we have an entomologist on board to maybe <laughs> figure out. What is that why he's going- here? I thought we I, just wanted to bring I, on I, another I, podcast. I, I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see. All right. <laughs> right. Tell, tell remind us, Daniel. Okay. Um, so here we have the case from TWIP one thirty, and as I like to say, for those. Um, clicking in for the first time or <laughs> for those uh, clicking back in. Yeah. Uh, we went back to Peru and this was the story of a 25, 24 year old female um, that I saw in the emergency room there in uh, Lima. And she lives in a rural area outside the city up in the mountains in the highlands. Uh, she lives in an adobe house with a thatched roof, dirt floor up at about 3000 meters, about 10,000 feet. And she comes in and when I see her, she's quite ill I actually showed a photo to Dixon where she's um, got a Foley catheter in um, and she's there in the emergency room and uh, she has a skin lesion, uh, which she's been developing for about the last 48 hours. And the story we get from her is that two days before when she was pulling on her pajamas, uh, she felt a sharp, sudden pain in the upper leg. And the next day she found a small living creature in her pajamas in the inguinal region. Uh, she went on to develop a red lesion, which then enlarged, developed a black central dot. Uh, she began to develop vomiting, and she was brought um, to the hospital. She's actually brought by her brother. I don't know if I mentioned that before. Mm. Um, there was uh, no fever, but she was breathing rapidly, um, more than 20 uh, respirations per minute, normal is about 16. Uh, heart rate was uh, 70, blood pressure 160, over about 100. And on exam, when we looked in the inguinal area, there was an enlarging necrotic area, 
It was about one to two centimeters, um, so that's a little less than an inch in diameter. Um, she was actually starting to look quite sick. Her white blood cell counts were elevated, uh, but 26,000. Wow. Normal's about 10. Uh, there was this left shift, which we've talked about before, where we have more um, granulocytes, mm-hmm. PMNs. Um, platelets were 200. Eosinophils, eosinophils were 4%. Her bilirubin was a little bit elevated at 3.5, and she was starting to go into renal failure with a creatinine. Mm-hmm. Norm would be up to one. She's up at 4.9. Think of that on an exponential scale. So one to two would be like half of her. And then uh, me, uh, yeah, and then got um, a patient calling. Got a patient <laughs> calling, actually. That, no, that's, someone knows what this is, that's and they're what, calling in the you answer. You think that's what this is, because we're live. You're going to preempt um, the, the end of this uh, case history here. <laughs> And uh, her hematocrit was 14, right? So normal mm-hmm. would be about 40. So she's she's becoming anemic. She's going yeah, into yeah. renal failure. Something's bad. Um, she's got red blood cells and leukocytes in her urine. Um, she's got a little bit of an ele- elevation of her muscle enzymes. Um, and prior to this, she had been a, a healthy woman with no health problems, no surgeries. And here, this is her first interaction with the health system. She's got no mm-hmm. toxic habits. And... She brings in this little small That's creature. Incredible. So we're gonna we're gonna actually um, discuss um, what this small creature was. Did you take a picture of it with your cell phone? So the, here's you know here, <laughs> here's the and this is why it's great that we have uh, Jonathan on board and that we have yeah. Dixon here is that as a clinician I really rely on the laboratory people. <laughs> I think I have this quote that like a, a doc without a laboratory is like a feral dog. I mean, we, we need someone to sort of correct us and guide us and ship with And so, heel. you know, so I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest, right. You know, I, I don't know, I can't identify this. So the lab is going to have to look at mm. this and then, and then tell us what, what is this little creature? And that's going to really help us clinically here. Right. Well, we did have some guesses. Boy, didn't we? And Hannah was the first dear twip. Doctors, I'm time to embarrass myself with another case guess. <laughs> Apologies in advance for the long email. If it is really an arthropod, as you implied, and not a small mammal or snake, I see three possibilities here. <laughs> One, a non-venomous arthropod bite that got infected. Two, a venomous arthropod bite sting. Or three, a venomous arthropod bite sting that got infected. In the first case, it could be just about anything, although biting flies seem unlikely given the circumstances of the bite. Getting bitten while putting on pajamas suggests that the arthropod was hiding inside and that it was defending itself when crushed against the skin. A lot of bugs, hemiptera, have both the mouth parts and temperament to defend themselves in this manner, as do beetles and many, many more. Mm. Since I doubt you'd give us a case where the answer is, quote, one of the several million <laughs> arthropod species that could break your skin when squashed, letting unknown bacteria into the wound, end quote, let's move on to the venomous arthropods. One of the many stinging bees, wasps, and ants could conceivably cause these symptoms, at least in conjunction with a bacterial infection. Bees and wasps generally don't hide in pajamas, however, and while ants might crawl through clothing on their way somewhere else, it seems still seems unlikely, especially since there was only one bite sting. Centipedes are a real possibility. I don't know what species are found in her region, but their venom can cause intense pain and swelling and they could conceivably hide in clothing. I don't think their venom is likely to cause the other symptoms, so this would once again point to some infection. This brings us to the arachnids, specifically spiders and scorpions. A minority of species have medically important venom that can all by itself cause some or all of the symptoms experienced by the patient. If it's a scorpion, I can't speculate further. I know next to nothing about that group, (laughs) though aside from the pain, the description of symptoms in parasitic diseases doesn't seem to match. Given that the patient is in Peru, the spider genus Phonutria immediately comes to mind, Brazilian wandering spiders. That's a nasty one. Despite the common name, some species are also found in Peru. They are known to hide in clothes, but the best of my knowledge, they're tropical forest spiders, so I wouldn't expect to find them in highlands. Mm Mm-hmm. Much more likely are the genero Latrodectus, widows, and Loxosceles, recluses. Both widows and recluses are shy, non-aggressive spiders that may occasionally find themselves caught up in clothing. Latrodectus, how do we say that, Jonathan? Latrodectus, that's good. Latrodectus are more commonly encountered in their webs, however, and their bites are not necrotic. Any necrosis seen would be from an infection. Loxosceles, on the other hand, do not weave webs love to hide in clothing, and their bites are famous for being necrotic. While bites are typically painless and necrosis usually takes longer than two days to develop, it seems 
like the most likely culprit. Many Luxosceles species can be found in Peru, but El Deita is the most well-known. And bites from this species can cause both skin lesions and systemic reactions, including renal failure. Before I sign out, I just want to share this excellent stat article on delusional parasitosis, also known as Ekbom syndrome. It gives a link to that. I'd be very surprised if you didn't have a few listeners who suffer from this awful condition. It may benefit them to know that they're not alone and can get help. Thank you so much for everything you do. Cheers, Hannah. P.S. Dr. Griffin, I'm the one who brought up some of the issues in the arthropods section <laughs> via your website's contact form a while back. I apologize if I came across as overly critical or rude. I really do think you guys are doing amazing work, and I'm thrilled that you got some entomologists on board to make this textbook even better. Mm-hmm. I just want to point out that this article is fabulous. Uh, accidental therapists for insect detectives, the trickiest cases involve the bugs that aren't really there. And it's about this delusional parasitosis where people think that insects are crawling all over them and into them and hatching within them. Yep. And the picture of the lady, she's uh, an entomologist in the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. She has hissing cockroaches on That's her nice. sleeves. They're about two inches long. They're cool. Yeah, they're it's a pretty I'm, neat article. They're nice. I'm and sitting cool. next to my cockroaches. See that? I knew. I knew. These, they, they are weird people. Entomologists are <laughs> basically. Well, you have to love them, right? Yep. Well, they're not turned off by the usual things. <laughs> Dixon, can you take the next one? I sure can. Carol writes, she was bitten by a wandering spider or a banana spider. Banana spider. Carol. I'll read Wink's also because oh. that was pretty short. Wink writes, dear Twip team. The case of an apparent bite and multi-organ system failure sounds like a dangerous arthropod to me. My guess this week is spider bite. I found the following excerpted information in Wikipedia. Loxosceles late, commonly known as the Chilean recluse spider, Mm -hmm. is generally considered to be one of the most toxic species. It has a very wide range, including Peru, and has been documented at elevations. Wink, Weinberg, Atlanta. Okay. John writes, Hi, Twipperati. My initial guess in the case of the Peruvian woman was the inguinal insect bite was that she had disturbed a recluse spider, either Loxosceles laeta or L. intermedia. That spider lives in South America. Bites, when disturbed and closed, can cause lesions and necrosis. If this is the case, direct treatment options for the woman are limited. Symptoms can be treated to give the body a chance to recover itself. On the other hand, the family home should be nuked from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. And I think she has a link here, which you click, and then Trump drops a master bomb on the site. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. However, I'm sorry about that. However, <laughs> okay. 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 however, I am confident in the diagnosis. The time frame is extremely short from bite to serious consequences. The review of the paper, a mnemonic device to abide, to avoid false diagnoses <laughs> of brown recluse spider bites, we get a link here, indicates that ulcers would not be expected by a week. Unfortunately, it's not open access, and all I could read was the preview. I look forward to the answer in the next episode. Thanks and regards. John in Limerick, Ireland, where it's 11C, cloudy with sunny spells. There's only one false assumption in his statements, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're going to ask me to point out, and it says, my initial guess in the case of the Peruvian woman with the inguinal insect bite. We didn't say it was an insect bite, did we? No, we just said it was a bite. Now, right? John, how do you know it was an insect bite? <laughs> Sounds like the, inter- the introduction to a murder mystery. <laughs> uh, Are you sure you weren't there in Peru the day that she got? <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's, we it's just a said bite it was a by bite. an arthropod. It's we just arthropod. said a small creature. It we did. We didn't say an arthropod. It, we never said it was insect. I don't even so know that. if we know that that creature did that. It may have just been an innocent exactly. bystander. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so, right. So most people would say insect bite and then say, oh, yeah, it was a spider. And without realizing what the difference was, that's all. By the way, the video that yeah. John linked to is a yes. clip from Alien, where at the end of the first movie, <laughs> right. he said, you know, to kill this thing, we have to nuke the whole space station. That's it's the right. only way to be sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very good. And as it turns out, there were three other versions of that movie, so that didn't work either. Nita writes, greetings. Hello, TWIP team. I have recently tuned into the podcast and find it really fascinating. I am a soon graduating medical student going into neurology, but I really like parasites and had mm-hmm. been trying to find a good resource to learn about them. Mm-hmm. This is my first submission, my first guest submission, so please be kind. I'm going to Tokyo soon <laughs> for my vacation, <laughs> and I'm excited to visit the Meguro Paralog- Parasitological Museum. Hope I'm the lucky 14th emailer. For our 24-year-old female Peruvian patient, 
My first instinct of a rapidly progressive necrotizing with black central dot is the brown recluse spider, but maybe that's my affinity to spiders. <laughs> After doing a little digging, I did find that the Chilean recluse spider is quite venomous in Peru, and recluse spider bites can cause breakdown of muscles that result in rhabdomyolysis and acute renal failure. However, looks like it doesn't cause increased WBC count necessarily. Womp womp to this guess from an arachnid fan. After some digging, such a rapid exacerbation of clinical course as well as the red lesion with a black center sounds a burrowing sand flea tunga penetrans. The flea male has a black dot at the red end, and that's what marks the change. However, I'm not sure of the time course. Those are my two silly, sexy answers. Doing this in a rush so I didn't get to think it through, just jotted down the two zebras that popped into my brain. Mm. Dixon. John writes, Twipsters, greetings from Omaha, the city that hosted the very vibrant meeting of the American Society for <laughs> Parasitologists in 2015. Check out these exciting and fun playing cards ASP made for our conference goodie bags. And then he gives a link for that. Picture. I'm, I'm sure they were great. Yeah, they're, they're playing cards with, with, with pictures, pictures of, of parasites. parasites. They're lovely. Of course they are. From <laughs> Omaha. Yeah. So my students used them recently <laughs> to prepare for the parasitology lab practical. It doesn't get any more vibrant than that. <laughs> I haven't attended an ASTMH meeting, but ASP includes parasites of veterinary importance and others without medical importance, such as Gregorin's and horsehair worms. ASP also addresses the evolutionary ecology of parasites, which may interest the environmental science major from Colby Sawyer College. Many attendees enjoy the relatively small size of the meeting, which facilitates collegiality and is an undergraduate and is undergraduate friendly. I would attest to that because I've been to many of those meetings. Also, no one tries to sell you anything. My guest this week for the case study is the brown recluse spider, Loxosceles sp. Not, although not a parasite, I look forward to incorporating this case study in my zoology class. I concluded my parasitology lab with the infamous 109 case study. I didn't tell them about the twist in the case, and they went nuts when they heard the big reveal. Encouragingly, two students guessed the correct parasite, but not host. All right. Do you remember what case 109 is? The famous I, Bronx Zoo. That was the Bronx Zoo. Oh, that, that was great. That is exactly right. Yeah, so this is a nice one because I was hoping, well, this is, I'll use this, the pun intended, but I was hoping someone would bite on my comments. Well, I just thought that that case was <laughs> uh, easy to guess because it was so black and white. Oh, yes, uh... that was, uh, that's terrible. So I don't know if Jonathan knows. So we did a case where it was a young, um, maybe two-year-old who developed fevers. That's exactly. And uh, it turned out it was malaria in a, it was a penguin. Yes. At the Bronx Zoo. That's right. A major, major Whoa. Penguin. And uh, the, the story, which is interesting, <laughs> is that there's um, indigenous um, malaria in, in the birds, and they, they've uh -huh. co-evolved, and they're fine with it. But when you bring in either Arctic um, birds or birds from isolated islands that didn't co-evolve with malaria, they get quite sick. And they die. And they die, so... That this penguin survived, right? It was treated, Good. and uh, yeah, That's with anti-malarials, they put it in the, in the fish... And they exactly. feed them to them. Exactly. So. But we went to the Bronx Zoo for that one, remember, for the reveal? That was great. We did a video, and then we went into the lab afterwards and did a, a twip in the lab. We could right? have even named that episode the Emperor of All Maladies. We could have. <laughs> you know, um, so something. there's something on TV now about the Bronx Zoo. People are telling me left and right, did you yeah. see that special? And I said, yeah, but did you see the twip special in the Bronx Zoo? <laughs> of course, no. Of course not. And ours, I thought ours was better. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen the other. I need to watch to compare. Yeah, yeah, that's, I do. Too, the, uh, right. But I also that was nice. I, I made a little quip about uh, the ASTM meeting. It's nice that someone brought up the ASP meeting, uh, American Society of Parasitology meeting. And I think um, you know what was the comments here is that it is a smaller meeting. It is. It's uh, going to actually be sort of broader as far as what mm. parasites will be covered. Um, you know and. Being a card-carrying member of both, I actually think that I was yeah. hoping I was hoping I would provoke someone into actually um, <laughs> giving us a little bit of a plug good. for the American yeah, yeah, Society. It worked. So. It worked. All right. It's okay. Good. Good. Sullen. They're all listening. <laughs> <laughs> Sullen writes. This one really has. I think me that's Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen, not yeah. Swellen. No, Sue Ellen. Swell. I need a pronunciation guide <laughs> even for the name. As names. a physician, <laughs> I wouldn't blame him for saying Swellen. <laughs> Swollen. Yeah. Sue Ellen writes this one really has me stumped which i guess isn't saying much considering that i've not gotten a diagnosis right yet this time i try to take more time and jump 
to fewer diagnostic conclusions. But I can't find a parasitic disease that would manifest so quickly after a bite from a critter in one's pajamas. My initial guess was cutaneous leishmaniasis, but that takes weeks or months to develop. And lesions are not just where one is bitten. They are all over the body and especially on the face and other exposed areas. Next, I decided to rule out certain vectors. For example, a mosquito is unlikely to get into someone's pajamas. And even if it did, the person is not likely to be able to catch and bottle the mosey a day later. <laughs> Fleas fall into the same category. So I am ruling out mozzie borne illnesses such as malaria and dengue, as well as anything that fleas might carry. Sand flies. I don't know much about them, so it's hard for me to say whether one is likely to end up in pajama bottoms or to be able to be captured easily. But the diseases that sand flies and other flies carry just don't come on that quickly after a bite. Tick-borne parasites. Again, everything I researched would take a week or more to become symptomatic. The same with bacterial diseases. They just don't show up that quickly. And it ruled out Chagas disease because it also takes a while to show symptoms. And also because I don't think a Reduvid bug is likely to show up in someone's pants legs. Also, she has no fever. So I came to this. Either one, the bite did not cause the illness. The patient was getting sick and just happened to get bitten or stung right before <laughs> she began to feel really bad. Or this is a case of myiasis where she's actually gotten a fly larvae of some type living in her skin. And that is what is making her sick. Now, I've read about myiasis seems to indicate that this is more of a tropical or subtropical problem, and our Peruvian patient lives in the arid mountainous regions of the country, but I suppose it's still possible. It also appears that usually you get more than one bite, but maybe our patient reacted quickly enough to avoid being bitten multiple times. And of course, the scalp and neck are the regions where most people would often get bitten, and so again, this diagnosis is looking a bit thin. And she can't tell, but also Dixon is cringing over here. So that, yeah, that well. thins it out more, I guess, maybe. <laughs> maybe A bite maybe. that occurs when you're putting in your pants seems much more like a defensive move on the part of a critter that, oh, look, I think I'll lay my egg somewhere where, hey, I'm being suffocated in this pants-like kind of thing. <laughs> but if I move along this line of reasoning, I need a critter. And the only one I could find that seemed to fill the bill was dermat Dermat Dermatobia. Dermatobia hominis. Oh, the human botfly, which is endemic to the highlands of Central and South America. The problem is that the literature seems to be void of any symptoms other than ones related to the skin, itching, etc. No mention of vomiting or other signs of illness. And I don't see a botfly seeking out a pants leg when a scalp would be much more handy. So I'm left with the possibility and the illness are not related, but are simply coincidental. Or that this is not truly a parasitic disease at all, but either poison from the bite of a spider or scorpion or something Dr. Griffin thought up to make us all go crazy rooting around in Google. <laughs> Laughing out loud, nah, he wouldn't do that to us, would he? But I'm afraid that after all my research, I really don't have a diagnosis. But now that I've written all this, I'm going to send it anyway. So you know how that I tried my best. Yes. Thanks for keeping me guessing. Dixon, you have to admire she went through she it all, and then at the, the end, question, <clears throat> and then she's thinking of real parasites, right? right? Not right. ectoparasites, yes, which it might not be. Who knows? We haven't heard yet. Her only small hiccup is that the botfly actually doesn't transmit myiasis for Dermatobia hominis. It catches a mosquito and lays its eggs under the abdomen. Mm. Remember? Yep, it do. So she I wouldn't. Do. Have, she wouldn't have found it there anyway. Right. Our last guest is from Carl Dear Twipnicks. Twipnicks. I was listening to Twip 130, and as soon as I heard that the center of the unfortunate woman's lesion had turned black, I hollered, brown recluse. Fortunately, I was my, by myself <laughs> and so did not frighten anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Upon later consultation of parasitic diseases, sixth edition, I discovered that I was wrong as one would expect of an amateur diagnosis. But I was close. Right genus, wrong species. This is a case of loxocellism caused by a bite of a spider in the genus Loxoceles. Given that the case is in Peru and the severity of the systemic symptoms, the species is most likely Loxoceles leta. It's a sunny and record-setting 87 mm. Fahrenheit here in Lexington, right. Massachusetts. Right. Jonathan, how do you say it? Loxoceles? That sounds good to me. All right. <laughs> I've heard Luxosceles. Luxosceles. Yeah, would work. I like Luxosceles, yeah. Jonathan's like, too forgiving, right? It's like a... <laughs> Whatever you say, Dixon. You... <laughs> no, you can have a, a, a friendly discussion about this. Isosceles. It's like isosceles. That's right? correct. It's like Luxosceles. Beautiful. Luxosceles. All right. Nice guesses. Right. What did you do? You, she brought the critter in, Daniel. Last time we said, what did it look like? And you said, no, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think that might that might give might give it away. We'll have Jonathan assuming we'll weigh the in critter on, did it. We'll, right? we'll weigh in on this. Assuming. Um, so we, we actually had what we thought was a compelling clinical picture for mm -hmm. a certain um, 
thing to have happened. And she had this critter in, in this little container. So the critter went off to the laboratory people who identify these things. And um, it, it's, you know, I think maybe Dixon could speak to this, how they do it at Columbia. But at a lot of labs, it's the parasitology people that also have a certain expertise in identifying. Hmm. Well, here in Long Island, a lot of it is ticks that they're looking at. That's right. Um, as well as arachnids and mm-hmm. yes. other, mm-hmm. other critters will be very broad here. We have and, a Lyme disease group here, so they would have someone there that's used to looking at nymphal ticks and identifying mm-hmm. them. Yeah, when I was uh, spending time at the parasitology lab out on Long Island, when I think we had that case of the one with the kinococcus, and oh, was, yeah. um, you know, we, we would do the arachnid stuff out there as well. And so there, this woman brings in an eight-legged creature, eight. <laughs> eight-legged <laughs> creature, and and maybe Jonathan can help us a little bit. But apparently there was an important issue with the number of eyes. Yes. <laughs> there were, there were. they tell me, three pairs of eyes. Um, so six eyes total. And so I don't know right. if that, that helps us in any way. Because you guys, maybe, maybe this is now enough and, and you guys can tell me what the diagnosis is. I want to see what the back of the uh, spider looks like. Okay, so so Dixon wants to see the back of the spider. I do. Vincent, do you do you want to see anything? Well, how do we know the spider actually did this? If this is a spider that we're talking about, right? Oh. Yeah, Jonathan, and maybe you want to weigh in on this. Uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is people come in all the time claiming to have spider bites. Yes, they and, do. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe I'll word this in a diplomatic way. They come in concerned that they may have had a spider bite, that's and right. and perhaps that's not always the case. Uh, very rarely is it the case. I think that your, your patient is a exception to the rule in that they caught the offending specimen rather than just saying it was a spider without any actual evidence. Mm. Right. And w- what's the problem with the eyes, uh, Jonathan? So, uh, a, uh, a, a recluse spider would have six eyes arranged in a U shaped pattern, mm. three pairs of two. And that's a very unique pattern amongst the spiders. A lot of spiders have six eyes, but they're arranged differently. Other spiders have eight eyes, and they're arranged in a variety of patterns. But the recluses have a very diagnostic set of eyes. Uh, what did it look like in this case, Dan? <laughs> so that's what we were told, that this actually had the, uh, the pattern, the characteristics of a huh. brown eight-legged arachnid. And uh, it was actually consistent with the... Chilean recluse spider, okay. or the Lexosceles laeta, and um, and and clinically it made sense, right? Um, as we talked about with this person, they actually were developing this necrosis in the area. They were developing the mm-hmm. the muscle breakdown, the yep. renal failure, yep. this sort of septic type picture. Exactly. Um, so so clinically it went along with the concept, and we had this call. That, that was what made this sort of a perfect case yeah, yeah. Um, in my mind, um, you know, because. As Jonathan points out, we, we so often people come, oh, I've got a spider bite. It seems to be like the way maybe it would offend the virologist where everyone has the flu. And you're like, well, <laughs> stomach well <laughs> they have a stomach yeah, every, everybody has the flu. You're like, well, it's not the flu. <laughs> like, I just right. don't feel so well today. Exactly. I must have a touch of the flu. And apparently people feel the same way with spider bites. I must have a little bit of a spider bite here on my leg. And <laughs> this yeah, people is, are always telling me, uh, oh, I've got one of your viruses. I'm not feeling well. Oh, <laughs> right. Really? One of your viruses. My, my, what would you yes. do? Give it in the tomb for it. Come on. Yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> now, meanwhile, uh, how long did it take for the lab to identify the spider? Very quickly? It was very quickly. I mean, yeah, we okay. were. she was in the ER, ran it over, and the person looked at it and said, hey, Our, that's, um, we that's no what this is. Of this and the reason, the reason um, actually, I can show Dixon some pictures. Hmm. There's some pictures, Dixon. Showing Dixon a picture of a, a an eight-legged um, arachnid, and it can actually oh, the eyes. Thing. Yeah, no, actually, this is it. This is the brown legged arachnid. You can actually see the eyes. Dixon can't see well, so I have. I, I to, want, uh, no, no, I want to see the back of the spider. I want you to blow it up for me. What's uh, on the back of the spider? You'll see. I can't see anything. Yeah, I can't see anything either. <laughs> if what, I could get you our book, what are you, what are you looking for? Oh, it's in the book. Yeah, there's a pattern. It looks just like a fiddle. You know what he's talking about, Jonathan? Yeah, uh, Loxosceles, they ha- they're known as the fiddleback spiders. So uh-huh. there would be a shape on Correct. the back, a Correct. color that is different than the rest of nice. the body. Exactly. And it looks like a violin. That's right. Do you have any in your office there, Jonathan? <laughs> do uh, I have some in vials, yes. We do get some specimens brought in occasionally yeah, really? of recluses. Yeah. It's been introduced to this country, yes? Really? 
Uh, not of the Chilean. I have I have the okay. the normal brown recluse. Okay, because <laughs> one of the apocryphal stories I was told um, a long time ago, but which apparently is true, is that an entomologist from Harvard went to South America and brought a colony of them back mm-hmm. in jars, screw cap jars, and kept them in the basement of the biology building in Harvard. And one of them fell off and broke. <laughs> and they colonize the entire basement, right? Because there's lots of lice and yeah. cockroaches and stuff like this. And then one spring break, they had actually left that building and gone into other also. Some of the students who went home had them in their luggage. Wow. And they distributed them. So now Texas has an endemic center for one of these rare Luxosceles species that you wouldn't find too many other places, but it's there, and they they can trace it right back to this experiment uh, Mm -hmm. at Harvard, of all places. (laughs) So So, I'm not accusing Harvard of of, uh, (laughs) species uh, transplantations, but uh, in fact, this may really have happened. So Jonathan, the, the brown recluse you'd find throughout the U.S., is that right? In the central and southern regions. It's uh-huh. furthest northern point would probably be around like Des Moines, Iowa, maybe, yeah. uh, or here in Omaha as well. It doesn't get too much further north than that. And it's not present in states like uh, Maine or Florida, per right. se, right. Uh, or maybe a little bit in Florida. But there's another species that's in the southwest. What about here the, in New York? Through, would we have them in uh, New York? It would, I would be really surprised if you if you found brown recluses in New York. Again, like he was just saying, species get moved around thanks to human assistance a lot. But <laughs> it's true. It's it's not the most habitable space for them. Mm. Right. So, Daniel, what did you do with the young lady? So interesting enough, you know, we yeah. made. I guess I think of this, you know, almost like a uh, a snake bite or something. It's a yeah. venomous yeah. creature biting. So we actually um, there in Peru, we had anti venom. And there's actually a chart that's mm-hmm. kept in the ER, and you, you want to know what, what the bite is and, and how much of the anti-venom. So she mm-hmm. got two of the vials that, that were there, um, and um, you know a lot of supportive care, right? I mean, she had the, the renal issue, mm-hmm. she had the anemia, um, so fluids, and, um, and she, we put her on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Broad-spectrum was Clinda in this case, yep. um, and uh, you know, she eventually did well. Mm. But, uh, Did she you need know, any reconstructive surgery on the area because of the lack of uh, the destruction of muscle tissue? Um, you know, at least at the point when I had left, no. But, um, you know, you sort of have to see over I, I've time. I've seen one case where this poor little girl got bitten on the face. And uh, it's a necrotic sloughing of skin. It almost looks like flesh-eating bacteria. And um, she had to have a complete reconstruction. Plastic surgeon hmm. came in and, and reconstructed that part of her face. It was really a a terrible disease yeah yeah i mean we were worried about this woman not just i think cosmetically but you know with the anemia the fact that the location was was right there by the thorax the the more central the bites Mm -hmm. um, at least clinically we tend to um more often have problems uh that are more distal at least from the life-threatening right i mean you get a you get a bite on the face you get a bite on your foot or hand and and the local um necrosis can can be a major issue as far as functional and other impacts the phonutria that was mentioned in the first letter was that's people have died from that Mm -hmm. you know especially small children and yeah it's it's really an aggressive spider it runs after you basically and it's all over the place in the jungles. And I t- have, uh, Jonathan, have you ever run across one of those in your travels? <laughs> uh, no, not in my travels. <laughs> Luckily, it's <laughs> frightening to just read about them, to be honest, because they're they're brazen and they they they're not intimidated by a much larger object like a human. That's mm-hmm. the one that like uh, people say it gets in the bananas and gets shipped to England and stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. But they'll if they I've seen pictures of, of tourists that have encountered them on trails that that they were on uh, eco tours in various oh, parts, yeah. of, and this thing rears up on its hind legs and s- spreads its fangs. It's really intimidating. It's it's, <laughs> it's it. I spent six months in Australia. And if you want to go to a country that knows it's poisonous spiders, that's the country. That's right. <laughs> Everything is poisonous down there, right? <laughs> and they had a laboratory down there that had collections of virtually every poisonous animal that you can name in, in Australia, including the box jellyfish. And the one that they all were fearful of was the funnel web spider. Yeah. Because that it's everywhere in the southeast portion of uh, Australia, and it's on the beaches, and it's in little – and it chases you. It's territorial. So during the mating season for the spider, it actually runs after things that that look as though they're threatening their territory, mm-hmm. and that's 
really <laughs> unnerving, to say the least. Now, in the case of this spider, um, my interpretation, um, and maybe Jonathan can jump in, us. this was a defensive bite. It was yeah, not yeah, like the, right. the, the right. spider was not hunting and hiding and waiting for its prey. No, it was more no. of, I think like as one of our movie. emailer put in, I'm being crushed and suffocated. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Know. That's right. Jonathan, does that, does that make sense? Or you think this yeah. was... <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the misconception that people seem to have about spiders is that they're all out to get us. Exactly. That they're they're all these aggressive species. They're just looking for a fight all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When really, most of them they hide and if they're in the pajama pants, you're crushing them with your meaty thigh. Yeah. Then yeah, they're going to turn around and bite you. That's right. But the venom is very expensive for them to produce. It's not something they want to waste necessarily on defense if they don't mm-hmm. have to. That's a great point. Now tell me, um, Dixon, how does this uh, recluse fit into the moniker of parasite. It doesn't actually. Okay. No, it's a noxious animal, but uh, it's it's part of the medical entomology. Yeah, I understand. Uh, addition to you know the parasites that we normally okay. discuss. So this is a this is a bit of a um, a ringer. It's right? sort, of a bit of at, a sort of at the edge. Yeah, and I I think like <laughs> what was there one of the. Uh, <laughs> One of the people emailed in when they were like looking for a true parasite. I think we came yeah. up like we had that woman with um, not quite intestinal myiasis, but the woman who um, the maggot larvae, right? Yes. And then passing through. Yes. yes, um, yes. And, and in a sense, this is a creature um, that would fall in at the edge of our, you know, we, we have that back section of the Correct. book. And part of the issue is, you know, who, who are the experts when you get to ticks and spiders and which doctors do you call and you know so some wilderness medicine people have jumped in and said okay mm, i'm gonna mm, try to mm. learn about this yeah. um, some travel medicine people have jumped in um, but somehow the infectious disease people have um, whether it's jellyfish or spiders <laughs> or right. stingrays or sort of this assortment exactly. of exactly. other we we've, mm-hmm. we've sort of embraced as yeah. the, the parasitologists and but it yeah. does raise that issue is is this really parasitism and in this case not definitely really. definitely, no, not. definitely the, not the the brown recluse does not want to bite no. person well so it doesn't remain associated in any way with the, right. the host nor does it it's really a, it's really like biting. a predator but then again it's not a predator it's not no. it's an accidental no, it's a defensive, defensive bite, bite. It's a very defensive well sue ellen had it right she said what Daniel do this to us? Would he pick something that's not really a parasite? And he did. And you know, when you first when you first joined us, you said, eh, you know, they might not all be parasites. Yeah. You did say that. No. Forewarned yeah. is forearmed. There you go. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, um, what, what do you do in your uh, daily job uh, when you're not podcasting? <laughs> uh, I do a lot of adult education. Uh-huh. So I teach people about all the different insects in their house and in their gardens and lawns. Oh, nice. And I do a lot of diagnosis as well. So uh-huh. people catch something and they bring it to me and they say, my house is infested with brown recluses. <laughs> and I, I have to inform them that it's a wolf spider or a carpet beetle right. and talk them through what, what's actually going on. That's wow. a big part of my job. And and so you're you're – employed by the university is that correct correct i am part of the nebraska cooperative extension service outstanding so does the state pay for you that is correct yeah wow. yeah the, the state of nebraska is my employer and, and uh, your office is at the university is that right so i'm actually in a county office i'm uh-huh. i am in omaha nebraska and i work in douglas county mm-hmm. so that's my territory i cover only two counties in the state, Douglas and Sarpy County, but they contain nearly half the population of Nebraska. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds like an interesting job. Are you also involved with farmers? I don't do any. Uh, I'm an urban entomologist, according to the state. So well, I fantastic. don't do anything with corn. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. You, you have no idea of how many people I've encountered in my technician days that brought in little vials and said these came out of my nose. Oh yes, and you, they're, you mentioned carpet, they're carpet before. beetles. <laughs> they're, oh no, and, you know they're <laughs> tiny little carpet beetles, and and you take a look and you say, hmm, now what do you do? Yeah, and they say, well, guess what? They all came out. You don't have any more. Well, there you go. And sometimes Helps they buy into that, but other times, you know, that's your fifth. <laughs> you're the the fifth lab they've taken that to that day that day because they just want attention. Yeah. Jonathan, do all states have people like uh, yourself doing this? Um, I would say every state has an extension service as mm-hmm. part of the Morrill Act from 1914. Mm-hmm. So all of the land grant universities, so New York would be Cornell, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, they all have extension services, but not everybody not everybody has a 
entomologists dedicated just to the kind of stuff that I cover. But we actually have two here in Nebraska. There's me and my colleague, Jody Green. Dr. Green is in Lincoln, and I'm in Omaha. No. Fantastic. I think you've had her on your podcast. Is that right? Uh, no, actually, we need to get her on the show. She's uh, She's got to get on there and talk about termites. That's her area of expertise. Termites. Yes. Wow. How long have you been podcasting? Uh, I've been doing arthropod for probably a year and a half mm -hmm. consistently now. Cool. And before that, I did some other podcasts for probably three years, maybe four years. What's the most un unusual, interesting case that you've had? Oh my! <laughs> uh, when you say interesting, like, do you can I go into ek bombs and everything? No, like no, that? no, no. It has to be real. It has to be real. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever have uh, little, little kids that collected tarantulas and they all got loose? <laughs> no, no. I did have. I had a, a woman come in and I thought that she had ek bombs based on what she told me on the phone. Yeah. But she came in and she actually was infested with bird mites. Oh my. They were all over her oh, bed because she had been sleeping with her window open right. and she enjoyed watching the birds that had built a nest there <laughs> and would like interact with them Eek. and gotten bird mites all over her and she brought in several reams of scotch tape and when I looked through them there were all these little bird mites in there. Is that, that Dermanissus? Was, what's that? Dermanissus? Is that the genus? Uh, I'm not sure of the genus off the top of my head, but they're not supposed to be on people. Yeah, that's for sure. Them. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Pretty neat. In fact, we have a letter coming later about sheep ticks. Ooh. That Jonathan, you'll like to, to deal with. All right. Before we move on, I would like to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone Support a more sustainable food system, set high standards for ingredients, and build a community of home chefs. What they do is deliver right to your home step-by-step -step recipes along with all the pre-portioned ingredients that you need to make a meal in 40 minutes or less and get this for less than $10 a person. It's really amazing. If you don't like to cook because you don't like collecting the ingredients, which is my case, this is great for you. Now, how do they keep the price low? They have a network of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S., all of which supply them materials uh, raised responsibly and sustainably, like uh, seafood, uh, beef, chicken, and pork produce, and they give you exactly what you need so there's no waste and you don't overeat. You can customize your recipes every week depending on your dietary preferences, and you don't have to have a delivery every week. You can get it whenever you'd like, and they ship... Uh, meals for two people or four people. They deliver to 99% of the continental U.S. They never repeat their recipes within a year so you don't get bored. And here's what's on the menu uh, for April. Spinach and fresh mozzarella pizza with olives, bell peppers, and ricotta salata. Sweet and sour salmon with bok choy, carrot and ginger fried rice, and baby broccoli and fontina paninis with hard-boiled egg and arugula salad. Check out this week's menu. Get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash twip. That's blueapron.com slash twip. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. All right. Speaking of cooking... <laughs> <laughs> The, nice title segue. Of, the title of this paper, uh, we'll give it away. It's a paper uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, it's called Post-Babesiosis Warm Autoimmune Hemolytic Anemia. So the warm part is the cooking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I, cooking. I got that. We, you got it? We both, we both got that. <laughs> you did too, Dixon? We did. Wow, Dixon, did, I'm, I'm impressed. I, well, it's, the meal had been prepared yesterday, and now you were just warming it back up. Warming it it's up. It's leftovers. <laughs> and, and Jonathan, we picked this paper with you in mind because we wanted to have a, a topic that was, would be of some interest to you, right? And, uh, so <laughs> I we, appreciate that. <laughs> so we have, you know, uh, babesiosis, tick-borne. <laughs> and so we thought you'd be interested in hearing about the ticks, which I'm sure Dixon will tell us about as well. Oh, yeah. Now, this is a paper from Brigham and Women's Hospital, the venerable Harvard Medical School, right? And Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Div Divisions of Infectious Diseases, Transfusion Medicine, Hematology at Harvard Medical School. And um, I asked Daniel to find a, a paper with um, a hexapod. Would that be fair? 
<laughs> oh, this would be an arachnid. An arachnid. This would be a <laughs> yeah. different. Oh, I asked him for a hexapod. Hexapod me plus two. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go, Daniel. What caught your eye about this? You know, babesiosis is this great parasitic disease of the Northeast. And uh, on Long Island, they have this, well, they have the New York Infectious Disease Society and they have the Long Island Infectious Disease mm. Society. And we get together um, periodically and discuss interesting cases. And without fail, the new infectious disease fellows from other parts of the country present this case. Mm. And they're all very excited. We're like, hmm, could it be Bapisa? Yeah, right. they're, all, they're all shocked. How did you know that? <laughs> and it, it's quite common in our area. And so I think maybe, actually, I think I presented a case previously about a man oh, yeah. um, who got it from a transfusion. He was a yes. gentleman who was transfusion dependent because of oh, uh, hematological yeah. malignancy. And he came in and um, it was actually early, I guess, late winter, early spring, and he had gotten it from a transfusion. And so it's a very interesting topic, and it's spreading. I mean, Babesia mm -hmm. used to be Nantucket fever, and, right. but now it's, ah. you know, it's actually moving. Mm -hmm. They're starting to have it screen the blood um, in eastern Long Island, and there's discussion about Connecticut now and, and yeah. how, you know, it's, yeah. so it's becoming more and more of an issue. And um, the great thing about this paper, it shows what you can do when you have a really good electronic system is they were able to go back and look at um, almost 90, 86 patients over a seven and a half year period and um, look at this questionable phenomenon that people have been postulating for a while. Mm -hmm. Is there this warm, which we'll discuss, autoimmune hemolytic anemia um, that can develop after the fact triggered by Babesia? Mm -hmm. um, Dixon, can you remind us of the life cycle? Uh, I will be happy to do so. And in fact, it was the very first arthropod-born life cycle ever described yeah. uh, by a <clears throat> Cornell graduate, by the way, I might add, um, Theobald Smith and colleague uh, Kilborn. Uh, Kilborn? Kilborn, that was his Fred last Frederick name. Kilborn. Frederick Kilborn. Frederick Kilborn. I always remember Kilborn. He always remembers Theobald. But I, 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 I don't know. Kilborn is actually <laughs> quite a player in the world of infectious disease. Okay, fine. So then they, they both collaborated. <laughs> to They were called in to look at the, um, the disease which was plaguing cattle down in Texas. Mm -hmm. All right. And it was called Lone Star Fever. And they eventually identified a tick species mm -hmm. known as the Texas Lone Star Tick mm -hmm. uh, as the culprit in transmission because they had eliminated virtually everything else as a possibility, and they knew it wasn't cow to cow by just simple contact. And it, it turned out that what their disease was was um, Babesia by Gemina, mm -hmm. which is a, a, one of the most common species of, of, of Babesia in the United States. And um, they were the very first people on Earth to um, discern that arthropods could carry infectious diseases mm -hmm. from animal to animal, and shortly thereafter, then mosquitoes and then black flies and reduvid bugs and sudsy flies, et cetera. It, it mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. opened up a world that people had only imagined before. But because of their finding, it gave them the courage to go on and, and look further. So these these are seminal discoveries. And Babesia is a parasite. It's a protozoan parasite, related. Right? It's an apicomplexan protozoan parasite yeah. related to malaria. And it looks a little bit like malaria on the blood smear. But its life cycle is really bizarre inside the tick. The sexual cycle takes place in the tick, mm -hmm. and the asexual cycle, of course, takes place in, in uh, animals. What's the What's the reservoir host? Plenty. There's tons of them. There's deer. There's mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there are cattle. There's rodents. There's all kinds of animals that can acquire this infection, including humans. We're just an accidental host. We're accidental. Okay. We are. There's no definitive host. But the definitive host is, is the, the tick. The tick. Yeah, because it harbors the sexual stages. Got it. And that's always the terminology we use in parasitism. <laughs> parasitism yeah, yeah, yeah. is a definite, like wherever you have sex, yep. that's your definitive. Exactly. All right. It doesn't get better than that. Let's and so just... people pick it up. People that's pick it up. Find your home. Home people is are... not where the heart is. It's where you have sex. <laughs> exactly right. People have <laughs> uh, get infected when they encounter a tick that's had that's picked up from another animal, not another human. Yeah, and this can be transmitted vertically, also. By the way, as far as I among recall, among the ticks, yes. I, am I right on that one? I know the word Ketsia can, but I might have made a mistake just now. I think maybe uh, Babesia cannot be transmitted vertically. All right. Now, when it, it's when too it big. When a tick bites you and delivers the, what form does it deliver into the blood of the human? It's the sporozoite form. The sporozoite. And then where does it go? It goes right into the blood. 
and stays. That's where its life cycle that's is. That's correct. It doesn't and have a liver phase like the uh, malaria parasite. Does it mature or transform in any way in the blood? Just uh, It just penetrates into the red cell, divides, kills the red cell, and goes into another one. It just keeps doing okay. that. So it's an intraerythrocytic correct. protozoan. That is correct. And because it's killing red blood cells, you get... Well, anemia, hemolytic anemia. anemia. That's right. right. That's great. But you also get immune complex disease that develops uh, over long term. So that's what this paper addresses. That's what right. is the role of of a post um, infection syndrome? Jonathan, do you have any experience with ticks? Uh, just getting them on me and getting them <laughs> off of me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Do you have people who say I have a tick and you have to tell them what it is or yeah. that sort of uh, thing? We do get a weird amount of ticks in the office. Yeah, I've had in, in fully engorged ticks that uh-huh. somebody came in and I had to help them pry it off their arm. Uh, we've had ones brought in an alcohol. People find them on their dogs. So, yeah, we get some sure. ticks here in the office. Sure, sure. So, so Daniel, part of the uh, syndrome here is, uh, first of all, people with babesiosa have a ne- hemolytic anemia. True, true. Right, and then there is autoimmune hemolytic anemia that so results. well when this paper comes out people have discussed that that might be the possibility so so the relationship here to malaria now we will often see pretty high parasitemia um we'll say 10 to 20 percent i've often seen 10 percent in uh, babesia cases where we we saw that in a malaria patient mm. this is a very very critically ill person um, and there can be um, anemia during the acute process. But then there's this phenomenon that um, people have noticed, and I will mm. give a little bit of a hint, particularly in a subpopulation, the asplenic patient, patients without yeah. spleens, right. which actually originally we didn't know Babesia could infect people who had spleens. Um, the earliest described cases were asplenic um, patients who, and, you know, and the, the deal, I think, is that we initially identified the most ill people. And then once we've identified it, we start realizing there's more of a spectrum. Um, But what people were noticing is these asplenic people, um, a a solid percent of them, seemingly, right, this uh, this paper is going to help us, would two to four weeks later develop an anemia. And at this Mm -hmm. point, the smears are negative, right? right? So we we think, wow, they're they're doing well. You could still PCR up, um, but that's very sensitive. So Mm -hmm. we thought, well, I don't even know what that really means. Um, but they're developing this anemia, and so the theory was maybe there's an autoimmune component. And it makes sense when you think mechanically. Your your B cells, the B2 cells, right? I mean, they'll take two to three, four weeks to make their IgG. So so maybe that delay yeah. was germinal center maturation making IgG. So the paper here is really looking in that phenomenon and saying is is – what people have been saying, mm-hmm. these getting these anecdotes and converting them into data. I was just saying that nicely this morning. The plural of anecdotes is Anecdotes. not data, not data. Not, <laughs> it's that's anecdotes. Right. Fake. And, and here, here is let's really look at this yeah. warmly, critically, and try to yeah. figure out is this really an issue? And then, then if it really is, we can identify it and plan for it and hopefully come up with ways of approaching it. Right. Then they introduced this concept of warm antibody autoimmune. Hemolytic anemia, right? And that's that's critical. And again, this goes along with the timing. So this will be so two things. We'll talk about autoimmune hemolytic anemia, okay. and then we'll warm versus warm versus, versus okay. cold. So these and what they did, they mined their patient data. These are previous patients from 2009 to 2016 that they found in their records, and uh, they found 86 with a diagnosis of babesiosa. Babesiosis during this period. This is at Brigham and Women's Hospital right. only. Right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so babesiosis. So the so the so autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So you've you're basically destroying your red cells, which is going to create anemia. The autoimmune being it's something up with your immune system is doing it, mm-hmm. and, and there might be four potential ways. But we're going to focus right. on the antibody, the IgG or IgM related, which is what's going to fall us in classically into our warm and cold, and our warm. Um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia is going to be an IgG mediated, mm-hmm. and our cold is going to be IgM. Okay. And so there, there's also a timing ability. So you get exposed to a certain infection trigger. The IgM you make right away in the first week, so you see early. Yep. If this is a warm autoimmune IgG, we're going to expect a two to four week delay. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, maybe when we get later on, we'll talk in their discussion about IgE mediated. Um, immunocomplex-mediated issues, and then either a cellular immune 
Um, but at this, the time course, we always postulated that this would be a warm IgG mediated. Um, when you're using the word warm, yes, you're actually you're referring to a temperature. We actually are. So this is a this is a hemolytic anemia that occurs at room temperature, and so in a cold autoimmune. Um, you're going to actually see the hemolysis probably occurring in the fingertips, right? In areas that are below. Mm. Um, uh, and the warm, and they actually do this in the lab, is mm. when you, you do the lab testing at different temperatures, the assays will give you oh the God. hemolytic anemia. At It's a temperature-dependent process. So what other autoimmune diseases do you know of that does this? So the, the classic that always comes to mind would be like some of the hepatitis, but mycoplasm. Mycoplasm. Mm-hmm. Mycoplasm will give you an yeah. autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Interesting. So, which is a nosema, by the way. It's a, nosema. It's a nosema. <laughs> nosema. No, no, that's different. That's, 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 I'm sorry, Jonathan will take offense if you say that. <laughs> nosema. Yeah, yeah, those are six legged critters. <laughs> those, yeah, yeah. Hex- They're hexapods. crawling around. Biting. Those are the punkies. Those are hexapods. Yeah, those are. Yeah, and I should jump in and, and actually confirm what Dixon was saying. You know, we, we, we put babesiosis in the minor parasitic diseases in our textbook. <laughs> and I actually thought at some point we may have to move that, but maybe it's a regional <laughs> bias. Um, but similar to Lyme disease, you can actually have this vertical transmission. So mm-hmm. the timing we'll see of this disease is in the summer, right? Because it's going to be transmitted. The larvae are then going to grow up a little bit, let's mm-hmm. say. And so, so it is a vertical transmission. As well, it is vertical within the tick. Okay, fine. So I stand. I sit correct, and I start up. No, you, you that. stand up confirmed. No, no, no. Then I changed my mind. I said oh, maybe you, it is. You shouldn't have, shouldn't have done I shouldn't that. have just, done that. Just stand firm. But then, thank God, we have um, we have our textbook. We can open our textbook. We can, do, <laughs> we can quote I can't it. Can't remember everything, everybody. Now, yeah. come on. So Dick Dixon's eighty-six patients with confirmed 86. babesiosis, right. blood smear, or PCR. Eighteen without spleens. Oh, that's remarkable. A splenic. A splenic. So they had them removed at one point in their lives, right? Probably for Probably. Like leukemia or something or else. They had a, or trauma. The trauma. Yeah. Or that's trauma. A, that's a common one. Exactly. And um, nine. So uh, explain this, Daniel. Blood bank testing was performed in 20 patients. 12 had direct antiglobulin tests performed. Nine of 12 were positive. What is an anti? Oh, so th- this is interesting. This is this <laughs> indirect versus direct yeah. Coombs test. Okay. And um, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the red cells. We'll, we'll talk about the direct, which is really, you know, yeah. the primary issue. So you take your red cells and you wash them right. and you're washing them off. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to wash all the proteins away, right. except something that is really bound you know, and if we have anyone in the audience that's flow cytometry or antibody staining, antibodies, when they bind, they really bind. So what you're trying to see is are there cells that have antibodies bound to them already? And so then once they've been washed off, you're going to add a second um, mm-hmm. antibody to see. And if it does, it's going to bind the antibodies already bound to the red cells and they're all going to agglutinate. They're going to clump together. Now, your indirect is you're going to take the serum and you're going to throw it on, on red cells and see if it, if it no, binds. It. So it's going to be an indirect reaction. So seven S. splenic patients had warm autoantibodies identified. And six of those had clinical post-babesiosis warm a, waha, right? <laughs> yes. Warm autoimmune hemoglobin <laughs> anemia, waha. Right. And no alternative uh, explanations for clinical hemolysis. All right. And they have a, a sentinel case, a 43-year-old woman... 15 years previously had had her spleen taken out for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. And then 2009 developed fever after getting a tick bite. Two weeks later, she was confirmed to have B. microti parasitemia. Now, that's a rodent parasite ordinarily. Yeah. That is. And so, but people can be infected. They're occasionally infected. That's correct. All right. Uh, so she was treated and at discharge, low parasitemia. Four weeks after her diagnosis... Her hematocrit declined to twenty five percent without parasites on blood smears. Right, that's a typical presentation of this syndrome, right there. That, that was what we postulated was would be going on is that you have these um, IgGs that are developed from the B two cells in the germinal centers, let's say spleen or other places, and that these are going to be binding to something on the surface of red cells, and mm-hmm. this seems to be what they're yeah. we're seeing. And the timing's right, except she didn't have a spleen. Well, that's the, that's the interesting <laughs> issue, I and mean, maybe we'll get into that. Yeah. Like, well, it seems to be a problem when you don't have a spleen. And why is that? What is what is the spleen yeah, they, supposed they do, to be uh, doing? They do speculate on that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, she had uh, evidence of hemolysis and clear, and they they identified a warm and autoimmune antibody, 
And then um, got four weeks of prednisone, and she was fine. No more hemolysis oh, after that. Prednisone. Yes, the opposite of what you would give to someone with an infectious disease, usually. It's an immunosuppressor, It right? is. That's mm. right. There's only one other disease I can think of. That's the one I used to work on, trichinosis. Yeah. Where they actually give you immunosuppressive therapy to keep down the innocent bystander reaction. So then they look at their data. They have six cases of post-babesiosis Waha, so it's similar to her. She was the indexer, sentinel case. But they have similar cases as well where um, these individuals, a while after diagnosis, when there's very low or no parasitemia, they develop hemolysis. And they have Waha, <laughs> <laughs> Waha uh, antibodies or post-babesiosis Waha, um, different severities and so forth. Um, they had all undergone splenectomy. Yes. Yeah, we saw for various reasons. Like some, you know, most of them it was cancer. It was, was brought up. One was traumatic. One was hereditary spherocytosis, wow. which is where the 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 red cells, I believe it's a spectrum um, issue, where they're they're not forming the normal um, yeah. size, and they actually get cleared by the spleen. And so, by removing the spleen, you prevent the clearance. You prevent the splenic exactly. induced clearance. Exactly. Uh, now, Daniel, they say no patient with post babesiosis waha underwent exchange transfusion for treatment, whereas six of the other 80s in the cohort did undergo transfusion. So, what does what does that mean? So, exchange transfusion, um, and this is something sort of in the AP complexin world, right? Malaria, they'll do it. And so, you have this idea: is you've got um, a lot of infected cells. So, what you want to do is get those out and replace them with uh -huh. uninfected cells. And when people see a, a ten percent parasitemia, they, they often get quite um, concerned, mm -hmm. and you know might resort to this. And so, that's what they're talking about. Basically, you're taking out infected cells, you're transfusing in uninfected cells. So, what's the the significance of the fact that no patient with Waha had these transfusions. I think one of the concerns people would raise is getting blood from somebody oh, else. Is that triggering this autoimmune reaction? So right. nice in here that it's a sort of a clean um, phenomenon. Plus, yeah. they couldn't find any parasites. Yeah. So why would they transfer clean blood into a situation which is clearly... Yeah, that's right. There you go. You don't need to. Exactly. It'd be a waste. Right. Yeah. You have to find a cause for the autoimmunity, I think. So is that really uh, is that basically the data, uh, Daniel? Is there anything else you wanted to highlight there? No, I think I think that's the data, and then you know they they go on to have a little bit of a discussion, and I I think they talk about um, you know what sort of a um, hypersensitivity reaction is this type one, which is an IgE, a type two, right? As we talk mm -hmm. about the IgG versus IgM, yeah. um, is it type three where you're getting immune complexes somehow causing the destruction, or is it a type four where somehow the, the T cells are coming in and destroying them. And I think the, the bias going into this is that it was going to be a type 2 IgG mm -hmm. warm. And, and I think they do a pretty good um, you know, sort of study of, of suggesting that that's consistent. Yeah, so they suggest maybe, so type 3 would involve um, the antibody response to foreign antigens leads to overproduction of IgGs, production of immune complexes, um, and they are removed inefficiently by these asplenic patients, right? Yeah. And they're, when they remain, they trigger complement, which can lyse, uh, release inflammatory mediators, right? And then that can cause red blood cell lysis. So and the I, whole thing yeah. is about keeping the surfaces of red blood cells clean, which is what your spleen does. And they yeah, can't and they've lost their spleen. They've lost that protective effect. What is the effect on the liver in this case? Because uh, uh, Not the liver, I'm sorry, the kidneys. Because the uh, immune complexes could lodge and well, create that, basement membrane disease? Yeah, well, that, that would... Well, okay, so the... The issue, the idea, immune complexes we often associate with renal issues, right? Because yeah. they're going to the deposit yeah. there. And we're really seeing here a warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So it's much more consistent with a type 2 hypersensitivity and IgG mediated. And, and all their, their work sort of supports that. So type 2 cross-reacting antibodies against the Babesia yep. have been absorbed onto red blood cells. Right. And um, then they are 
Uh, Activating complement, you're getting you're getting red cell destruction. And and again, splenectomy doesn't get rid of those surface antigens. Yeah, normally would have gotten rid of. And in some cases, right, we'll see what's called an Ebbins syndrome, where the antibodies will not only just hit the red cells, but similar enough proteins might be on platelets. They might also be on neutrophils. So we can sometimes see the platelets being destroyed. We can also see the neutrophils. So you can get this combination of ITP, thrombocyta, penic. Um, we'll just say deficiency of platelets and also <laughs> deficiency of neutrophils. Not going to go through ITP. Dixon, they say a post-infectious delayed autoimmune hemolytic anemia has also been described with malaria. Yes, indeed. Including a few cases one to four weeks after treatment. And that is complete with basement membrane disorder mm-hmm. as well. So you get renal dysfunction as well. Now, right, so now this, I guess, Babesia as well as Lyme has driven a lot of people to want to do something to reduce the tick population. And, the deer uh, population. <laughs> well, no, that's the issue. So they, they say maybe if we just reduce the deer population, um, then we'll, we'll get rid of this. But somehow that doesn't seem to work. I don't know if, Jonathan, you want to <laughs> chime in. Why, why is that, you know, if you get, well, you know. They would feed on other things besides deer. So <laughs> uh, they're multi-host nice. ticks. That's true. That's so true. you get rid of the deer, they're just going to get on raccoons or something <laughs> yeah, yeah really i mean though yeah that's true it's absolutely true but there, there have here in the northeast where lime right has been an issue yeah they will often uh, what, what do they do they put out uh these basically toilet paper oh, yes. cardboard tubes with, that's right that's right with that's cotton right. in it yes. with with a something to, to kill what the ticks the ticks yeah no. the, so the mice will come and they will Use that to make their nests down below. Right. And it right. kills off the nymphal ticks in the mice nest. Got it. All right. Nice little trick. Yeah, nice little trick. It didn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a nice idea. <laughs> All right. Well, ticks are pretty much throughout the U.S., is that right? Yeah, they're everywhere. Ticks, it doesn't matter where you go, even in Africa, they're, they're everywhere. They're just basically everywhere. And, and, there, and there are two kinds, right? Jonathan? Tell, tell us. No, no, I want Jonathan to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> there are hard and soft ticks. Hard and soft. That's right. Uh-huh. And, and um, they have differences in the scutellum. Am, am I correct? <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> and uh, uh, they have this, the hard ticks have a harder surface on the outside. And when they feed, they can go like 300 times their own body size. Yeah, they look like grapes. Well, they, they, they get really huge. They're the crazy. soft ticks, despite being softer, do not get as large as the exactly. heart ticks. So that's exactly. kind of interesting. Yeah. And they both can carry lots of different well, diseases. Well, different diseases, different, right? Lots and of the soft diseases. ticks, we mm-hmm. talk about these relapsing fevers where they'll be up in these cabins yeah. and people go to sleep and the tick will come out, it'll feed, and then it'll go back. You don't even necessarily know you've been bitten because mm-hmm. they're right. not like a heart tick where it's right. going to burrow in and then take a period of time before it transmits. Yeah. Like Lyme, we talk about a 48 hour window to get them off before they transmit. The, yeah. the soft ticks that we see in the Northwest um, can transmit right away. Sure, and then there's the the um, the wild card, so to speak, of ehrlichiosis. Right, and I know someone who's actually been infected with all three of those organisms: Lyme, uh, Borrelia, uh, the um, uh, the Babesia organism, and indeed the ehrlichia organism. All at once, he's got his spleen. He's got a good immune response, and he almost died. Hmm. He didn't, of course, but uh, he almost did. So let's do a little exercise here. <laughs> In addition to Lyme, Babesia, Ehrlichia, what other infectious oh, diseases do ticks carry? Oh, the list is endless. Is it endless? It's endless. It's it's long. It's very, very long. It actually is quite long. You know, people would quickly think of Starry in the U.S. All of the rickettsia. <laughs> um, Every rickettsia can be transmitted. Mm-hmm. A lot of viruses. We get outside yeah. our world. Omsk, you know, we get into yep. strange. Crimean yeah. there's, there's fungo a, hemorrhagic fever, yes. really a bad one. Some licky yes. forest. Uh, hem, there's a ton of them. There's just an absolute. Colorado one. tick fever. Yes. Uh, what about Rocky, Rocky Mountain? Mountain Smotted? <laughs> Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is more common in Long Island than it is in Montana. Do you know why they call it Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'll tell her this. I'll tell her that <laughs> was do. That was well done. It was actually identified up in Missoula. At the Rocky Mountain Lab, Hamilton. so it's that's right. you know Hamilton. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, about thirty miles south of Missoula exactly. in Hamilton. Exactly. exactly. And so it was identified at the Rocky Mountain Lab. So you could say it's Rocky Mountain Lab identified spotted fever, but it actually is much more common mm-hmm. in Virginia mm-hmm. and the eastern, like outside of mm-hmm. the Rockies. Now in Colorado, we would see what we used to call as uh, 
spotless or Colorado, yeah, spotless. That's Colorado right. tick-borne that's right. fever. Yeah, and right. yeah, there's no, it's also the spotted fevers um, are tend to be much more virulent um, that's true. infections. So. so here's a list at the CDC of tick-borne it's, diseases of the U.S. It's not very long. Well, Anaplasmosis, no. Babesiosis, Borrelia, um, Colorado tick fever, Ehrlichia, Heartland virus, which has been found in eight people <laughs> so far in the U.S., Lyme disease, Powassan, Rickettsia, Rocky Mountain spotted, uh, Southern tick associated rash illness, tick born relapsing. This sounds pretty big to me. Wait, two more. (laughs) Tularemia. Tularemia. Yes. Exactly. And here's one. 364D rickettsiosis. (laughs) 364D. Sensing an insecticide or a weed killer. (laughs) Uh, Jonathan, do you ever think about, um, let's see, insects and arachnids in terms of their disease causing potential or you just think of them as, as what they are? Uh, I, t- I, my mindset is the other direction, but yeah. we have a lot of people that come to us concerned with what diseases they're going to get from things like ticks. Yeah. Sure. So out here, everybody is worried about Lyme, yeah. but we don't have the correct tick mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. most of Nebraska. That's really, we worry more about tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and those kinds of things. One of my deans last year actually got Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Wow. And I was very excited to, to find that out. <laughs> he wasn't, but I, I thought it was very neat. I don't know. I think deans deserve it. Oh, no, no. (laughs) Probably caught it in North Carolina while he was on vacation. He's a good dean? Okay. (laughs) He's a good dean. So we were happy that he pulled through. (laughs) That's good. That's good. He got it on a Boy Scout jamboree trip. You're right. Yeah. (laughs) I have an historical correction to make, and I don't don't want to disagree with anything we all say to each other, but I I know the story uh, pretty well of the establishment of the lab in Hamilton. The disease was discovered first, Mm -hmm. and they had four people that actually died from it. And they thought it was a very serious disease, and then they petitioned the government to establish a laboratory to to, to study it out there. Okay. And that's how the lab got established. They had like another 10 cases for the next 50 years (laughs) because it was pretty rare. However, uh, we learned how to to carry um, out experiments using... Uh, distance uh, instruments, all right? It began as a mortise and pestle type of thing with the Mm -hmm. the ticks. They had two laboratory workers that died from it. Mm. So they had to work out another way of grinding up ticks. So they, some guy says, I have one of these rotors that you use to smooth out the edges of Formica, right? So if you turned it upside down and attached a sealing um, uh, device that allowed you to take a canister and to put it on top of the blade mm-hmm. from the and you turned it on and you put it in another room and you did it you know remotely then you could uh, grind up ticks without worrying about aerosolizing the infection right in front right. of you at least okay so they did that and they worked it out and everything was fine so the, as the story goes and i was told this when i was in graduate school by um, my instructor so i believe every word he told me <laughs> this is dr roger williams who had a, a, a degree in medical entomology from the University of North Carolina. So he says, in the old days, um, government employees were not allowed to patent anything. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably still true, because you're not allowed that's to... correct, yeah. You can't make money on a government-supported research project. So Fred Waring, in his Pennsylvania... Did he Waring blender? He didn't invent it. He stole it. <laughs> and who do you think he stole it from? <laughs> the person who invented it out in Hamilton. Really? Yeah. He made it a habit of everywhere uh, he was playing, he would visit, if he knew there was a regional government laboratory there, mm-hmm. he would actually go in and ask, you know, what's new and what's doing? And he actually found out that this device was invented, and he turned that into a drink maker. He was also a, a chronic alcoholic. I was joking. No, you shouldn't <laughs> joke. So what do you think the name of the next most popular device is for grinding up stuff? Hamilton Blender? Correct. Yeah, no, there, that exists actually. Yeah, it's, it's named after Hamilton, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. No, that's good. So you've got, you know, two competitors yeah, all yeah. starting from the same places. That's funny, kind of bizarre. Uh, Daniel, do you have another case for us? Oh, I, I do. Wow, yeah. does it involve? Uh... Well, I, you know, that'll <laughs> be that will not. be interesting. <laughs> does it involve an arachnid or a hexapod? So. Uh, <laughs> So I, I will. Uh, are we ready? Yeah, yeah let's do it. So we are ready. This is the story. Now we're now we're in Thailand. Thailand. So this is a 39 year old man. He's living in Thailand. He comes in a report of seven months of cough. <laughs> he's coughing up blood. So he mopped this. He reports that he's otherwise feels well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it happened. But he was concerned that this was continuing. Um, so that I guess this is the, you know, how did you like the show, Mrs. Lincoln? Other than the fact that you're coughing up blood, how are you That's doing? Right. He does. He says That's he right. feels fine. Um, we, um, if people remember some of our prior, um, you know, we asked the usual questions. So what do you like to eat? So um, this gentleman is a big fan of salted crab somtom. <laughs> Do you remember salted crab sometime? I so, do. Who so, could forget? <laughs> so sometime is actually really good. And um, I had some salted crab sometime when I was in Thailand. Um, Did you cough up blood? So far, not not, <laughs> not yet. Um, but so the crab is not really cooked. It, it's marinated, mm-hmm. right? Um, he also works as a fisherman and he lives with his family. Uh, we'll get a little, little medical history here. Um, he is a healthy guy, no past medical problems, no surgical problems, doesn't have any allergies, family. So he's a, really a healthy guy, except for the fact that he's coughing up blood and likes to eat a lot of uh, uncooked um, marinated crab. Uh, he's not on any medications. He's a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he's fr- not from the big city, right? He's in the outskirts there. He lives with his family, but he's come here to the big city to, to be seen because he's coughing up right. blood. He lives... His travel geographic history is that he lives in this um, area of rural Thailand. He's a fisherman, not of seawater, but of the freshwater um, mm-hmm. lake areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he, you know, there's some time I throw in, but, you know, everyone eats crab sometime because it's just so darn good. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we see him, uh, he's afebrile. He actually, he doesn't appear to be any distress. Um, we examine him. It's not that impressive, but we get a chest x-ray. And it's abnormal. There's an area, I like to say, of increased opacification. It's got something going on in an area of his lungs. And uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to order some diagnostic testing. Is he a smoker? He is not a smoker. How often does he cough a day? He coughs several times a day. And, times. and up comes, comes blood. And this has been going on for seven months. And I think I should comment to, he's healthy. He's not losing weight. Yeah. And so I think that that was what made people sort of think a little bit in one direction versus another. Is this just blood or is it mucus containing blood? It's or? mucus with blood. Yeah. yeah. But bright red. The the blood is red. It's not a it's not a clotted old blood. Got it. Dixon has left. Yes, he's left the building now. I think he just took a little bit of a break. So he can't ask any of his questions. No. Um but you know, he's a married guy. He's got right. kids. Um, we don't get any concerning toxic habits no out toxic of him. Toxic habits. Um, all right. That's all you're going to give us? I think that's enough. I think that this is one of those straightforward. We've got Jonathan here visiting. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's eating. I, I don't know if, as a bug guy, you feel an affinity to um, to people eating poorly cooked crabs or. Uh, it, they're just big water <laughs> bugs, right? <laughs> right. You know, they they really are. They're arachnids, right? They're crustaceans. Crustaceans. Is that a sub subset of arachnids? It is not. Uh, so it's a different class. Arachnids are a class. Crustaceans are a class. A hexapod, that's a class. Or hexapoda. You know, when I was in... Um, I guess Arth- it was camp- a, a camp- crab is an arthropod? It is an arthropod. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, because it. it's Sorry, got the articulated. But, no, you know, when I was in uh, Cambodia, right. in um, Siam Reap... I actually had, um, I ate deep fried spiders and it actually tasted very similar <laughs> to soft shell crab. Yeah. And I, I guess, and I guess that makes sense. It, were they yep. very big cra- uh, spiders? They were very big. I have a photo of, um, yeah, it was really good. Have you ever eaten a spider, Jonathan? Uh, no spiders, crickets, no worms, <laughs> things like that. Really? I've done some cooking with insects for sure. Yeah. Cool. Entomophagy. That's a growing fad. Entomophagy. If you look at a Seattle Mariners website, they're selling (laughs) deep fried crickets or grasshoppers at the baseball games and they're selling out. They can't keep it in stock. I think that's got to be the title of this episode, Entomophagy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Why not? Dixon, you missed the the case, but. No, I didn't. um, No, I didn't. I actually got it. So that's why. And maybe you feel like, maybe you feel like you already know what it is. I feel like this is a, this is, you know, I I threw an easy one in here. It's an easy one. For me, it is. Everything's easy for you. No, it isn't. Did you get the last one? Yeah, sure. The brown? Not no, the brown, the Chilean recluse? Yeah. You got it. Yeah. All right. Well, this is your job, right? That's what I got paid for. Let's do, a few, let's do a few emails. Great. Um, 
first one's from Anthony, who sends us an article in eLife called Tracking Zoonotic Pathogens <laughs> Using Blood-Sucking Flies as Flying Syringes. Yum. So the idea here is that they, they ask whether blood meals from flies could be used to identify agents circulating in wild vertebrates. Mm. All right. So they collected 1,230 blood-engorged flies in Gabon. You know where that is, Dixon? I do. It's in Africa. Okay. <laughs> it's where the Gabon viper is. <laughs> they identified the blood meals from 20 vertebrate species, so they can do that nowadays, you know, the technology. You this can tell all true. What, what these um, flies have uh, taken blood from, including mammals, birds, and reptiles. And which flies were these? Um, you would like to know some details here? Blood, yeah, because... Blood-sucking ones. Because... <laughs> blood-sucking. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you see The it? kind that make you sick. No, no. <laughs> Because, believe it or not, flies have um, biting preferences. I will tell you in a moment. Let me finish. 9% were infected by different malaria parasites. Really? Among which some belong to known parasites, others to new species, or to lineages for only the vector was known. Oh. So that's kind of a proof of concept here. Now, you would like to know uh, what... Which flies? Which kinds of flies? I'll tell you. I'm, I'm going to download the actual article here because I, I didn't have it previously. I mean, uh, mint... Mosquitoes are flies, okay, mm-hmm. they're dipterans, but um, I presume they were looking for others as well. Yeah, let's let's check it out if I can uh, get it Especially here. Especially in Gabon. So, I'm sorry, you want to know what kind of flies? Yeah. Tsetse flies, stomoxids, and stomoxids. tabanids. Tabanids. <laughs> tabanids. <laughs> stomoxids, those are the stable flies, those are horrible. They're big. Yeah. No, 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 stomoxids are not big. No, uh, they just are annoying. They're worse than that. So, uh, so 4,000 flies. Okay. Uh, 30% were engorged with blood. They were mostly tsetse flies. Okay. 99% were tsetse flies. Well, yeah, because it's West Africa. And, and because there are river systems in West Africa, there aren't too many in East Africa. The tsetse flies are different. Tsetse. And much they, higher, they breed much along density. the riverbanks, and they can be in the millions per mm-hmm. square mile. Jonathan, uh, have you ever encountered a tsetse fly? Uh, no, there's a professor in the UNL department, though, the entomology department, that has a license plate, a vanity plate that says Setsy. Setsy. I like it. Yeah. That's good. Mine says viruses. It does. Oh, okay. Because that's what I'm about. You are. Right, Dixon? That's right. If yeah. I'm ever in New York, I'll be on the lookout for it. <laughs> well, if you're ever in New York, you have to come here and we'll take your picture. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you come here in our studio. We'll here. put you up against the wall of, of uh, virus. <laughs> Dixon, can you read this one from Dave? Now, now uh, Jonathan, to. this one, I want you to listen carefully because he okay. it, it's about ticks. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Dave writes, Dear host, I had a very unusual parasitic experience while shearing sheep in the Kamloops area of British Columbia. I'm used to seeing sheep keds. Those are um, actually um, uh, lice. But on this occasion, I was shearing a, a ewes And besides her udder was a fully engorged tick, not sure which type. I noticed it as I went through it with the shears. Now, generally, it takes a lot to creep me, but this was by far the weirdest. No. This was... At? (laughs) This was at? No, A. This was was at the far edge of the... Weird S (laughs) word, (laughs) ometer. Out of the cut half... Of the tick came a pile of baby ticks. These were the size of pinheads, but fully formed and crawling. Now, I haven't been doing a lot of drugs or drinking or suffering from any other (laughs) hallucination that would explain this. So even though I have read and heard that ticks don't give birth to live young, what is the other explanation for this? Thanks for this in advance, and sorry that it isn't human-related, but most of my parasitic experiences are of the ovine kind. Dave the Shearer in sunny southern AB, which stands for Alberta. Uh, P.S. Yes, Dixon, the fishing is great. About two hours west of us is the Elk River, famous for floating for float fishing, and I've actually floated that river many times, and I couldn't agree more. So back to the arachnid, or back to the, uh, let's say, uh, arthropod in in question here. If it was an arthropod, what could it have been that when you cut it in half, out come living copies of the bigger... (laughs) It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, to be honest, but um, what do you think? Let's see, Jonathan. Jonathan, what do you think of this? (laughs) 
Well, it, it, there's a famous <laughs> quote about that, right? Ad infinitum. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jonathan Swift. That's right. Something that's else. right. That's right. So potentially a parasite. Uh, ticks, they do have weird looking eggs that I, I presume if you cut one in half, the, the eggs could come spilling out, but they wouldn't be crawling. Crawling. They no. would be moving perhaps because they'd just be spilling out of the sheared in half tick. But he said fully formed and crawling. He was very specific. Maybe it yeah, was something I, else that ate a lot of ticks. No, what 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 else could it be? It, my guess would be if if Sp- they were moving around, it'd be mites. Mites would live inside of of other arthropods, but mm. I don't know of any specific mites that live inside of ticks. So, what if by weird chance this was a female spider, uh, and she had an egg sac on her back, oh. which was filled with baby spiders? I see what you're saying. That yeah, that would and he be- cut the spider in half, and out comes the baby spiders. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Well, and some carry them live around on their That's, abdomen. They do. So I would love to see a picture of these little pinhead babies. He said it was a fully engorged tick. He said it was a tick, but he wasn't sure it was a tick. No, he said, he's, he's shearing. I know what he so said maybe. it was. He said he doesn't yeah. sure what type it was. Well, I don't think it. I would disagree that it was a tick. Hey, Dave is a sheep shearer. He knows his ticks. You don't think so? No, he doesn't. He doesn't know. He said, "Not sure what type of tick." He says he re- he says he have read that ticks don't give birth to live young, and they don't. Yeah, so that's it, correct. So We're it, all agreeing on that. So it couldn't be a tick, could so it? So, Dave, can you send us a picture? Yeah, Dave. Did but you have, what did I'm you saying, have your iPhone with you? <laughs> all right. Well, Dave, I don't think he's got a picture. I'll I don't either. Send it. But, but send us a drawing, man. But even then, because <laughs> I like the spider explanation, but how could he mistake that for a fully engorged tick? That isn't that a bit of a stretch? No. 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 Or why is the spider hanging out in sheep's wool? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, no, it's near the udder. It's near the udder. It isn't the wool oh, itself. Okay. It's on the udder, so it's actually biting the sheep mm. beside her udder. So right. he that he said he noticed it as they went through it with the shears. Exactly. I don't know anything about this, but would you be shearing by the udder? Oof. <laughs> you want to be a little careful of those udders when you Yeah, shear. this is all Not true. Fine. This is a very mysterious case, but I would... Yeah. Dave I has would, written to us before, by the way. <clears throat> I would opt in my guess of guesses that what he actually cut through was a spider yeah, that well, was harboring um, babies. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, just right out of a movie I saw. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. I like that one. The next one is adorable, the way she addresses us. Uh, let Daniel read it. Andrea yes. writes, hi, Twipitos. You have probably already seen this one, and she gives us a link here. And Did you look at that? Oh, yeah, yeah, so this yeah, is sure. an article sure. about, um, <clears throat> oh, let me get through the ad. It's about um, a rat lungworm called Angiostrongulus cantonensis, yes, uh, which I guess uh, occasionally can do what, Dixon? Eosinophilic yes, meningitis. That's oh, right. I should say Daniel. I'm sorry, Daniel. Please, that's a okay. <laughs> physician on call. Let's take an image at least. <laughs> <laughs> can infect humans and goes for the brains. There yeah, you go. That's right. And so this is present uh, where, Daniel? Where, where do we find? So it? the cases that we see in the U.S. are Hawaii, but it's a Pacific. Um, oh, you can think about the name, right? Cantonensis. So it's an Asian Pacific Got organism. Got it. Okay. But there's another species that uh, has been found in New Orleans among the wharf rats. And so mm-hmm. uh, we suspect that it's also in people there, too. All right, Daniel, go ahead. Oh, boy. Now paradise is off limits. <laughs> it's 59 degrees Fahrenheit in Seattle with rain, of course. Love the podcast. Please keep it going, even though I may never send in a guess. <laughs> I do, I do enjoy listening to the cases, even even those that creep me out. Right. I now look at all mangoes with suspicion. <laughs> and That's Jonathan, cool. that was a case where a woman um, yeah. ate a mango. This was in the Dominican Republic. Right. And then the next morning, she actually had um, maggots in her stool. Correct. So we have to, let's go back to the lungworm <laughs> for a moment and, and ask, how would anyone catch this infection? Excellent question, Dixon. So, the way the rats catch it is the same way that we catch it, and they eat snails and slugs. Now, Why do we, if, who eats snails and slugs? Well, not many people. Seems maybe, yeah. <laughs> no, they do it on, by accident. Okay. And um, that's the way these usually occur, but there seems to be a large outbreak of this in Hawaii, so that must have involved a common source of, let's say, slug contaminated lettuce or something of that sort that people eat raw. Okay. And that's that's how they come by that's how come by, they, they come by this infection. Yeah, a piece of snail attached to raw produce. Exactly. 
even a tiny piece is enough to infect That's you. exactly and right. And this uh, doctor, um, with Dr. Sarah Park, a Hawaii State epidemiologist, says, yep. Yep. if you could imagine, it's like having a slow-moving bullet go through your brain. Exactly right. It's very, <laughs> very painful. <laughs> very painful. Well, there yep. you go. And yep. that's it for our letters, and that's it for uh, this twip. Anything else, gentlemen? That's been we've covered the gamut from A to P. <laughs> A to P. Yeah. Twip one thirty one at iTunes microbe dot TV slash twip. Uh you should think about supporting us financially. If you love what we do, give us a little financial help so that we can continue doing what we do and perhaps do a little visiting. Become a patron. Go to microbe dot TV slash contribute. We have a Patreon account, PayPal, and much else much more that you can do to support us. And if you want to send questions or comments, if you have an interesting story like Dave exactly. about a fully engorged tick full of live ticks, <laughs> send them to twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center. He's also at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, well, it's a pleasure, as always. He's in, he's in person today, actually. It's yes, good right. to see you. This is not just a hologram. <laughs> yes, oh, by the way, um, I, just when we first started... The sun was setting. It's now set, right? It has. It is set. While you two gentlemen were speaking, the light was flooding over you. It was just brilliant, and I took a picture of it. It's really lovely. I'll show oh, you. Right. I bit. couldn't see. The sun was right in my in your eyes. Exactly. So, so now I'm starting to see you again. <laughs> Dan Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org. He's also at the Living River. And, and Parasites Without Borders, too. Dot org. You are? Oh, yes. You can't, you can't have everything. We're co-founders. We are co-founders. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Our guest today is Jonathan Larson. Not only is that is he at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, well, he works in the state office, as he told us, but he has a cool um, podcast called Arthro Dash Pod, <laughs> and uh, we'll put a link to his uh, podcast in our show notes as well. And Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. This was a real pleasure. You guys are awesome. This was just a very relaxing night <laughs> we evening. Love <laughs> talking with you. You're you know you bring another. Uh, aspect to the science <laughs> the weird bug aspect no i love it yeah, no, absolutely. Love definitely it. <laughs> definitely fun and I'll, I'll endorse this podcast i am a subscriber myself so. there you yeah go. I, I am Thank i am you. as well yes that's right i have subscribed and uh, i listened to the latest one the other day and uh, congratulations on uh, keep doing it uh jonathan we enjoy it thank you i, w I will keep marching on i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.ws the music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, Blue Apron. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. So, uh, Jonathan, before you sign off, I wanted uh -huh. to tell you an anecdotal story about a graduate student uh, that was at Notre Dame while I was there. And okay. on his preliminary examination, uh, Dr. Craig asked him to describe the difference between millipedes and centipedes. Okay. And, of course, this guy was a, a vet trained at Michigan State University. He had no idea <laughs> what this was. He was a virologist. So he says, well, I actually don't know the answer to your question, but I know a limerick. With a question at the end of it. It actually was a question. And so he says, well, well, go ahead and tell us what your question is. And he says, okay, fine. He says, if a millipede a pint and a centipede a quart, how much would a precipice? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And the the um, the people who were asking this guy questions got so hysterical with this break in in serious you know really intense 
questioning that they they stopped the preliminary examination, oral exam, and they sent out for Cokes, and everybody had a great time when he passed. He said, oh, and by the way, you you might want to read some entomology. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the difference. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> but that was a great answer, I thought. I never forgot I like that, that answer. It's good. I may borrow that when I Oh, teach no, Bob please Lord. do. And don't give any credit at all. Just as anonymous, just go right ahead. And it's all yours. <laughs>